time we'll dismiss the young people uh, to children's church and that's for four years old and older and of course from zero to three we have the nursery in the back if you need that as well and for the rest of us we'll take our bibles and we're going to turn to romans chapter 12 please this morning romans chapter 12 we will get to the first corinthians 12 passage in just a little bit and this morning we're actually finishing our series on Discipleship 101. Now, this has been a a, a completely different way of doing things on Sunday mornings. We usually don't do this, but uh, we provided notes for you several, well, a few months ago, really, as we've been going through this Discipleship 101 study. Uh, To be honest with you, this is like a a new membership class uh, that we wanted to do on Sunday morning. Um, And it has to do with really the subject of discipleship and what that is. You know, it is possible to be a believer without being a disciple. It's also possible to be a disciple without being a believer. Judas was a disciple, but he was not a believer. And can I emphasize again that it is not being a disciple that will take you to heaven. It is being a believer that will take you to heaven. But while we're waiting to go to heaven, the Lord calls us to follow him. He said, come after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And so discipleship is something that is very, very important to the Lord and to all of us. And we've been looking at the relationship of the New Testament church to discipleship. But really, the two things are inextricably linked. Now, this morning, we're going to uh, finish our series by looking at something very practical, and that is answering the question, that many people have, and that is, what can I do? What can I do at church? And again, the idea is that the church is a community, and there's a very vital uh, part, and unique part, for you to play in the function of the New Testament church. Well, we're looking at Romans chapter 12. Uh, The two first two verses are very familiar to us, but I want you to understand something that, you know, in the book of Romans, In the first 11 chapters, he's told us what God has done for us. By the way, God will always do for you before he'll ever ask you to do anything for him. And really, that's the motivation to serve him is because of what he's already done for us. And when you get to chapter 12 through chapter 16, that's really the practical section of Romans. First part is doctrinal, what God has done for us. Second section is practical, what we can do for him. And that's the proper order. You see, you don't do for God so that he will do for you. That's religion. That doesn't work. That's not what the Bible teaches. 
God has already done for us. And then the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And then everything in the Christian life flows out of our relationship with him. Now it starts with, um, with surrender. Uh, we sang this morning, as you're all on the altar of sacrifice led. But I want you to notice after the first two verses, the context. It's all about the church. It's about the body. And it's about exercising your gifts in the body. The last part of chapter, chapter 12, verse 2, talks about that you might know that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. And the will of God you will never find outside of discipleship. It's always involved within that framework. So let's read uh, this morning Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 to verse 8. And if you're able, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. The Apostle Paul writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And our Father, thank you for your precious word that leads us, that guides us, it is the blueprint for, of life. It is the instruction manual. Lord, help us when all else fails to read the instructions and follow, Lord, the guidance that you've given us in your holy word. Lord, we pray for your help today, for me as I speak, and for these dear ones as they listen. May this be a profitable time for all of us. And Lord, may we not just uh, be hearers of the word and not doers, but Lord, may we put into practice what we learned this morning. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you so very, very much. Now, as we finish this study, I do want us to remember just a few important truths. First of all, that discipleship is something that was originated and designed and planned by Jesus himself. It was Jesus who had 12 disciples. But then also, um, as he sent out the apostles, that they were sent into all the world to make disciples of all nations. And that is something that Jesus has commanded. Uh, he commands us to follow him. And of course, it's our choice whether we obey or not. But I just want you to know that this is something that originates with the Lord Jesus. It's not something that the church concocted. It, is, it originates with Christ. And I love him. And I want to do the things that please him. And so if he wants me to be a disciple and to follow him, then I'm interested in that. And I hope you are too. Secondly, discipleship is linked uh, to involvement in the local church. You know, half of the New, in fact, most of the New Testament, half the New Testament was written by Paul, mostly to churches. Um, and if it's not written to churches, it's written to pastors of churches. And even in the general epistles written by uh, James and Peter and John, uh, it's written to believers in local assemblies. And so you can't divorce uh, the New Testament from the church, the New Testament pattern church. We're not talking about denominations. We're talking about what the Bible has to say about um, the local assembly, the ecclesia. And we've studied that over the last number of months. And so uh, discipleship is about following the Lord in the context of the ecclesia or the assembly of believers. And that's the context you'll find in the New Testament. In other words, there's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. Well, I'm just out here. I don't really go to church. I just go to the lake on Sunday and I worship the Lord there. Well, you know, that's okay, but it's, it's really not because that's not what the Bible teaches and it's not what Jesus wants. 
you know, and if we're going to follow Christ, we have to follow what he says. And so uh, the church is very much involved in that. Thirdly, the local church is important to every Christian. And we went through several uh, questions and answers about the church in our notes. First of all, we saw that the church is people. Um, the church is not a building. It's not a denominational structure. Uh, the ecclesia, the word church comes from the, uh, the English word kirk, um, which means it's from the Greek word kurion or kurios, which means the Lord or the Lord's. And so kirk actually means, or church means the Lord's. It means the Lord's people. And so the church is people. It, it's you. You are the church. And then this, the church has purpose. It's not just here as a, you know, we're not a club. We're not a country club. We're not some sort of a, just a gathering. The church has purpose, and that is to glorify God, to carry out the Great Commission, and to worship God and to obey Him. And so the church has important purposes. And then the church has precepts, and the precepts are found in the pages of the Bible. Uh, the church is to believe some things and to stand for some things and to defend the truth of the gospel which was once delivered to the saints. The church has a pastor. The church has leadership. And so the Bible uh, speaks of that. We've, we've studied that as well. The church has practices and it, practice, it should practice what it preaches and it should practice what its purpose is. If the church has purpose, then everything it does should lend itself to those, those purposes. The practice of the church uh, should follow the tenets and the pattern of the New Testament. And that is to exalt the Lord with free relationship to the Lord above. We exalt him. We edify the believers inside. We evangelize those who are outside. And then the church makes promises to itself. That was our last study. And uh, the church covenant, it's a, it's a promise. It's a contract that we make with each other. Uh, that membership in a local church is a very serious business. We can't just live any way we want to. Uh, we have a responsibility to one another to have high standards and we are responsible not only to God but to one another. We make promises one to another. Now our last lesson this morning, uh, I wanted to be practical um, and if you notice in your notes as we went through, the notes, let me just ask, is there anybody who have already taken the spiritual gifts test? Anybody have taken that already? One, two, three, four, several of you, that's good, you're ahead of me. Um, and if you haven't done that, I really encourage you, you might not want to do it while I'm preaching, but we're going to show you how to do that at the end. We'll put the slides up and show you how to actually take the test. And I think it's kind of interesting. I want to know what my spiritual gift is. And God wants you to know what it is. And every, every Christian ought to know what it is. And so we want to help you in that process. So there's three things in our notes we want to consider this morning. First of all, and these are fill in the blanks. So the reason we're putting this up here, if you have notes then and I have a pen, then you can fill that in. And so the question this morning is, what can I do? Sometimes people uh, don't feel connected to the church. And there's, you know, there's a bunch of people, well, maybe a small group of people seem to do everything in the church. And you don't feel like you have a place. You, know, you come in, you come to the service, you listen, you go out. Um, and that's really the extent of it. Well, really, uh, the New Testament church is more than that. There's a relationship that you're to have, uh, not just with the Lord, but with the Lord's people. And the church um, uh, really uh, requires involvement. And the Lord wants you to be involved um, in the local church. And you may think, well, what would, the, what would that look like? What does it mean for me to be involved? And that's an important question. And it's one we're going to try to answer this morning as we get into what role you would actually play and, and what would determine that role in the, your involvement in the church. But first of all, I want to notice that, first of all, that you are very important. Uh, you are very important. As a saved person, you belong to the Lord. Uh, you're his child. You're his saint. And you're precious to God. Now, God loves everybody. You say, how do you know that? Because... God commendeth his love toward us in the way we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How many people did Jesus die for? Well, the Bible says he tasted death for every man. So the reason I know that God loves every person is because the Bible says he died for every person. So if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, you're not saved, can I tell you that you're very important too, that God loves you and he did all that he did to save you. That you might live with him eternally. But those of us who have been saved. We have already been reconciled to God. And we are precious to him. We are his family. We are his children. Now it's illustrated to us in uh, many different ways. But just two I want to mention this morning. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 please. If you would. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we've mentioned this before. 
And aren't you glad for the rain? We were in drought, I think, but uh, the Lord has sorted that out last week, and our grass is finally growing. We're glad for that. So don't let the rain annoy you. Praise the Lord for it. In 1 Peter chapter 2, notice this first illustration, and that is that we are stones in his house. In chapter 2, in verse number 5 of 1 Peter, it says, Ye also as lively stones. Now the word lively means living. You're not dead, you're alive. And you are a living stone. You're a person who's alive, but you're connected to other stones, other people in the building. He says in verse 5, As lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now there's other places that speaks about this. Um, like in Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about different parts, and yet we're all one. Uh, we mentioned that in Romans chapter 12, there's one body, but there's many, uh, as, as a body, a human body has many different parts to it. Uh, so is the church. We are the body of Christ. Now, that's our next illustration. But um, when it comes to the house of God, the Bible says that we're stones. Now, in the olden days, and if you went to Ireland, many of the old houses are not built out of uh, bricks or, or cinder block, but they're built out of stones. And, and uh, really a lot of the tra tra tradition came across the ocean here to, to Tennessee. There's many places here in Tennessee where you'll have dry stack walls. We go to Ireland, they're all over the place. And they couldn't afford cement. They didn't need cement because a good stonemason will go into a field. And in Ireland, the, the fields are full of rocks, many of them. And uh, they just go pick the stones up. They bring them to the, the, the outside of the field. And then they put those stones together and they'll build a dry stack wall. So there's no cement involved. But I want you to notice that, that wall there. And let me just turn the light off so you can see a little bit more in detail. Um, all the stones in that wall are different. They're different shapes. They're different sizes, different weights, sometimes different colors. And yet a good st stonemason will put those together in such a way where it actually makes sense, you know. And it looks, uh, looks symmetrical. And it looks orderly, and it's level, and the top of that, that wall is flat. And some of those stones are small, and some of them are large. Uh, they're all different shapes, and yet it all fits together. I mean, here's two, two, uh, two smaller rocks right here, and here's a smaller rock on top of it. And these ro rocks are smaller than these two rocks on either side, but he put this little thin piece in here just to make it all fit and make it level. It's kind of cool. Here's a stone here that's kind of got a shape on it here. And that's just natural, they didn't cut that. And uh, here's another stone, actually it's two stones, and they just put that together where it just kind of fits together. Now the thing is, you're, you're different. Every single one of us are different sizes and shapes, and we know that. But, uh, but emotionally and spiritually, we're all unique, we're different. And yet God wants us to fit together in such a way where we actually support each other. We're not rubbing each other the wrong way. Um, we're comfortable together, we fit together, and uh, we complement one another, and we support so that the wall or the building is solid and strong. It's not going to fall down. And that's a wonderful illustration of what the church is supposed to be, because it's not like we're all cinder block, we're all the same, we've got square edges. We're all completely different. And the thing is, you know, you may think, well, I don't know how I would fit in the church because I might be a little awkward. Well, guess what? We're all awkward in some ways. Uh, some more than others. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, you know, if you've got a, like a triangular shape uh, stone and you, maybe you put the flat bottom, it doesn't fit flat on the bottom. But if you just turn it so that the V, you know, have you ever seen the, the keystone in, a, in an arch? It's amazing how they build those, you know, because you think it'll fall down. And the thing that holds it together is the keystone at the top that fits in and the gravity holds it and presses them all together. But, you know, if you just turn that stone the right way and it'll fit and it's just like, it just clicks. And not only that, but it holds the other stones together. It's a wonderful thing. So what you think is an oddity or something that's irregular and you think, well, this will never fit. Well, sometimes you just got to just adjust it a little bit. And you may be thinking, well, I don't fit in here. Well, I, I, honestly, there is a place for you to fit. And the master stonemason will take you and he will place you in a place where you will fit and you know you're fit. And other people will know that you fit. But it's a wonderful illustration that we are stones in his house. That even though we are unique, that we lock together, we fit together. If we're just flexible enough to turn each other or turn ourselves 
in order to fit with the other stones in the building. The other illustration is that of the body. We are part of Christ's body. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And this is a major scripture concerning this. Now, when we, we'll say this, it's in your notes already, but there's four passages, and only four, that deal with spiritual gifts in the church. Uh, four places in the New Testament. Romans chapter 12, and it's easy to remember, just chapter 12, chapter 4. Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and 1 Peter chapter 4. There's the only, the only four references. Now you say, well, that's spiritual gifts. You're talking about something else. No, because where you fit has a lot to do with who you are. And who you are spiritually was designed by God when you got saved. And when you got saved, God gave to you a certain spiritual ability to be used in the context of the assembly. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But it's the idea of the body. And he talks about it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll just read for uh, right now, uh, verse 4 to verse number 12, just to get the context. And then we'll read some of these other verses. So let's look at our Bibles. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. You know, there's many, many different spiritual abilities. Just like each stone in the building is unique, different shape. Um, so you are, there's nobody like you. You are unique there's, no, there's only one of you that God made. And you are unique with a spiritual ability that God has given to you. Um, and yet that uniqueness, all of us together, will fit together in one body. Okay, So, you know, my ear is much different than my eye. And my hand is much different than, you know, my elbow or whatever. They're all different. And yet they work together in one body. So this is what he's, this is the context here. There are diverse, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man the profit with all. Now let me just pause there. Because what that tells you is that the manifestation, which he's speaking about the spiritual ability that you get when you get saved, when you receive the Holy Spirit, it is given to what? Every man. There's no possibility of a Christian who somehow missed getting a spiritual gift. Every Christian has at least one. Sometimes there's more. But you have at least one spiritual gift. It is given to every man. Then, and he says in verse 7, uh, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Now, the word with all means everyone. So the spiritual gift is given to you, not for you. Now, that's really important. Um, spiritual gifts are not given. Now, I'm, I'm not, I don't have time to get into the whole cessationist um, doctrines of that some of the gifts had a temporary purpose, and some of them did. Um, I don't believe that there are gifts of miracles or gifts of healing today. Because if you have the gift of healing, I want to take you to St. Thomas Hospital and we'll just go down the wards and we'll empty the place. No, there were specific purposes for some of those gifts. The gifts of tongues, which is actually speaking in a different language that I, you know, that I didn't know. I would speak in, by the way, it was an earthly language. Acts chapter 2 says... Uh, every man heard them speak in, in their own languages, their own dialects, the wonderful works of God. And so not only would somebody speak in English, but he would be speaking with a Belfast accent. And that would really get a, the attention of a Jewish person who knew that this guy had never been to Belfast before. So uh, what God was doing was that there were sign gifts. God was helping them to understand that he was changing gears between Jew and Gentile and the Israel and the church and so some of those things were foundational the foundation of the apostles and the prophets but you know once the foundation is laid and the building start goes up the, the foundation's done away that's that's it's done you know you don't get your walls up to eight feet and then put another foundation in that's called the seal that's that, that's the second floor that's not the foundation so what I'm saying is some of the gifts were temporary but every Christian has a gift to profit the body so you don't operate your gift in by yourself um in the sense that you're alone you know people that they learn how to speak in tongues in their bedroom at, at you know at 10 o'clock on a saturday night getting ready for something you don't speak to in tongues by yourself um 
you know, and you don't operate your gift, whatever it might be, for yourself because it's not for you. It's for to profit with all, verse 7. It's given to every man to profit with all. Look down at verse 18, it says, But now hath God set the members, every one in the body, as it hath pleased him. So the spiritual gift is given to every Christian. It's not for you, it's for the edification of the body. So it has to do, you know, that this hand is here, by, it's not here by itself. A hand cut off by itself couldn't do anything. But it's really effective when it's attached to my arm, which is attached to the rest of me. And so when all the parts are attached together, it's working for the benefit of the body. The hand doesn't do its own thing for itself. The eye is no good if it's just for it by itself. It has to work in conjunction with the whole body. So the idea for Christianity is that it's a community. Uh, a Christian, the Lone Ranger Christian, out by himself, divorced from the church, doing his own thing is not scriptural. How's he going to operate his gift? Who's going to operate his gift for? It's given to profit with all. The other thing is that you don't get you don't get to decide what gift you have. You say, well, I want the gift of whatever. Well, sorry, you don't get to decide that. God gets to decide that. Let's just read on here. He says in verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man, the prophet withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, uh, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self same Spirit, Dividing to every man severally as he will. Who gets to decide what gift I have? The Holy Spirit does. If you look again down at verse uh, 18, he says, But now hath God set members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. It is God who decides those things. And he decided it, I guess, in eternity past. But you get it according to his will when you receive the Holy Spirit when you got saved. And that's why he says in verse 28, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of uh, miracles, have all the gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues? You see, everybody wants tongues. That was the same problem in Corinth. And they all, he says, well, you don't get to decide. God decides that. And not everybody's going to have the same gift. Right. There's diversities of gifts. And when he says in verse um, 31, But covet earnestly the best gifts, um, which are teaching and things that would edify rather than the, uh, the, the you know, uh, showy, demonstrative, uh, spectacular types of gifts. Uh, and what he's saying there is, uh, he's, he's not speaking to the individual, covet earnestly the best gifts. He's speaking to the church. And, um, you know, he's speaking to the church collectively, that the church collectively should emphasize the gifts that edify, not the gifts that are just sensational or entertaining. But the point is that God is the author of those things. So he said that we're members of his body. And if you look at verse number 12, he says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, whether uh, we have been all made to drink in the one spirit. By the way, when you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say for some of us. No, he says for by one spirit are we all baptized. And by the way, the church of Corinth was not a spiritual church. They were babes in Christ. They were carnal, many of them. And yet they had the Holy Spirit. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So there's none of this, well, I've been saved, but I need to get the Holy Spirit. So you're going to beg and plead that God will give you the Holy Spirit. Or beg and plead that God will give you a particular verse, uh, gift. No, that, that's, that's, not, that's not scriptural. When you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit, and you already get um, the spiritual gift in that moment. And so when you're saved, you're placed into the body of Christ, and you're placed into the body of Christ with that particular gift, with that particular position. You're baptized into the body of Christ as an eye, as an ear, as a nose, as a hand, as a foot, whatever it might be. God gets to decide that, 
And it's our job to find out what am I in the body? What is God's purpose? What is the involvement that I'm supposed to have? What is my spiritual gift? And how does God want to use me within the body of the local, the, the local church? Now the point, first of all, is this. Is God is the author of all of that. And what that means is you are very important. You're important to him. You're part of his body. You know, if somebody said to me, well, my hand's not, not, not that important, so I can just cut my hand off. Uh, excuse me, but I need all my parts. I need all of it. I don't want to lose anything. You know, I've got two eyes, but I want to keep both of them. And so you're important. You really, really are important to God and to his church. Secondly, you have at least one spiritual gift, as we've mentioned already. Now, this is not a spiritual, uh, sorry, not a natural ability. Um, it may be that when you were born and you grew up, you had certain natural tendencies and natural abilities that you had. And, that's a, and everybody does. Everybody's natural talents. I can play the bagpipes very, very well. I was all iron champion when I was 16 years old. And, and so I was very good at that. Now, I, I kind of gave all that up when I went into the ministry. But that was a natural ability that I had. But before I got saved, I was not a natural speaker. Now, you may think, well, you've got the gift of the gob. I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm the most shy, quietest person. I'd be most happy by myself, uh, not around anybody. So how in the world did I end up doing what I'm doing? I have no idea. <laughs> Other than the Lord saved me, and it was his, his choice. It wasn't my choice. I remember when I told my parents, and I was only saved two months now when this happened, and I said, the Lord, I believe the Lord has, uh, has directed me to serve him with my life. And he, my daddy said to me, he says, you have, son, he says, you've picked you for your life, picked a very, very difficult task for your life, a very difficult vocation. And I felt like saying to him, well, I, I don't really feel like I picked it. I felt like he picked me. Or I felt like I was just constrained to do it. Um, I remember when I was in technical college, uh, for part of my training as a diesel mechanic, and there was, you know, foundational courses for everything. And one of the courses was English and speech. And, and so I had to come before the class and speak for 10 minutes on a particular subject. Well, I brought my bagpipes in. It was like a show and tell type thing, you know. And I thought, this would be a doddle. I'd be able to do this. No problem. I got up before those other guys in the class. And my mouth just went to cotton wool. Have you ever felt that feeling? I, 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 and it was, it was hard. It was the worst 10 minutes of my life. I thought, man, I thought I could do that. I couldn't do it. It was a disaster. This is before I got saved. And I thought, man, that was the worst thing I've ever experienced in my life. There's no way you'll get me in front of people again. <laughs> and for the last 44 years, that's all I've been doing. If you'd have told me that when I was... And I didn't like to study as a young person. I didn't like school. I missed 80 days in one year of school. Uh, I went fishing. I became a very good trout fisherman, but I couldn't, I couldn't do math or anything else. Um, uh, and so, um, if you'd have told me, well, you know, the rest of your life you're going to be in a study and you have books and you're going to be studying things like homework all the time, I think you're nuts. There's no way I'm going to do that. And yet, that's what God has got for me. Um, so, it's not necessarily a natural ability, but when you get saved, God gives to you a spiritual ability. And many times, He changes your desires and your um, opportunities. To bring those spiritual gifts to the fore. Now let me hurry on. Um, it's important that you and I discover our spiritual gifts. And so the third and final point is this. You can discover your spiritual gift. Because your spiritual gift has a direct influence upon what God wants you to do in your Christian life as far as serving him. You know... You know <clears throat> It's important that you understand what it is. You ought to know. Uh, I certainly want to, to, to know. Uh, because your gift points you in that unique direction that God has placed upon your life. And so, and sometimes people get it all kind of mixed up. You know, if I'm an I, and I desperately want to hear, it's very, very difficult for an I to hear anything. And an I would get very, very frustrated um, in the audio business, because an eye is not designed to hear anything, but it's designed to see things. And so an eye is designed for visual, an ear is designed for audio, and an ear is going to be very, very happy and very good about hearing things, and an eye is going to be very good about seeing things, because that's what they were designed to do. 
And if you get this wrong and you're trying to get into a particular area that you're not gifted for, it can really uh, bring you to a lot of frustration. Now, sometimes we get along with things. But sometimes because we've never really investigated and really thought and studied hard about and looked at ourselves and, and examined ourselves and what other people think about uh, what we do and, and how we do things. And sometimes we can get, we can get along, but we're not really, we don't really find the exact thing that God would have for us. I told you this before, but, you know, I can take um, a bucket of sand, go into our utility room and open uh, the top door on the washing machine. Now, Leslie will be very unhappy if I did this. And I can take that bucket of sand and throw it into the washing machine. Go outside, get half a bucket of cement and come in and throw it into the washing machine. And I get a half a, bu a bucket of water and throw it into the, the sand and the cement's in the washing machine. And turn the washing machine on and it starts to go around. And you know what's going to happen? It's going to make cement. You can make cement with a washing machine, but your wife is not going to be very happy about that. And not only that, your washing machine's not going to be very happy. Now, the washing machine can get by making cement, but it's not going to be happy because that's not what it was designed to do. Maybe you're not very happy because you're really doing things. You're getting by, you know, the washing machine gets by, but it's, it was designed to wash clothes. And if it's not washing clothes, it's not really in the grave. It's not in the niche where it says, this is what I was born to do. Are you doing what you were born to do? Now, of course, this is important in life with your vocation and so on. If you find a job that you love to do, then you never work it in your life, right? Because it's, it's so fulfilling. It's the same thing with your Christianity <clears throat> and with what God would have for you to do. Now, how can you discover your spiritual gift? And in discovering your spiritual gift, you, do, you discover the place where you fit in the building or in the body. Well, as I said a moment ago, the gifts are listed in four different places. And so let's go ahead and turn. Uh, it's Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, where I looked at those. There's Ephesians 4. But let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 for just a moment. First of all, I mean, you really need to list what are the gifts. Um, well, what, what are the gifts that are available that God talks about in his word? Um, but let me ask you something. Uh, on a spiritual level, what do you enjoy doing? Uh, when you, I mean, have you ever taught a Sunday school class? And this is the thing, because some people never taught a Sunday school class, so how would you know? How would you know you would enjoy it if you've never tried it? And especially if you're a young Christian, you should try everything. It's the same thing with life. You know, if you don't know what you're going to do when you grow up type thing, just well, do something. <laughs> Don't sit there and wait for something to come along. Just do everything. Try everything. Do all kinds of different things. And then you'll find out what you don't like and you'll find out what you do like. Like in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says this, If any man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. It's speaking about the pastor. We talked about that bishop, elder, pastor, uh, shepherd. It's all the same office. If any man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be. So there's qualifications. But he starts with desire. Well, <clears throat> what got me into the ministry? And it wasn't a, something that I grew up like an ambition. I had, you must be joking. If there was a list of occupations on a, on a list for me when I was growing up <clears throat> in ministry, it wouldn't have been on the list. Pastoring would not have been on the list. Maybe a diesel mechanic would have been on there, maybe something else, but no way it was on the list. Um, the thing is, that all of us need to try different areas of ministry to see what you actually like to do. What do you want to do? What do you desire doing? Now, God placed that desire in my heart when I got saved. It wasn't there before I got saved. It wasn't on the list before I got saved. But God placed that in my heart. And it wasn't really, you know, I wanted to be a pastor. I was scared to death of that. I thought, well, I, I could never be a pastor. When I was at school, people were at, well, you called to preach. And I said, well, I had to figure that out. But I really volunteered to be like a, a, like a child evangelism, working with puppets, because I had done that. I thought I could maybe do that. But to be a pastor of a church, I don't think I could do that. I'm not cut out for that. I told you this. I'm not cut out for it. In my natural abilities, I'm not cut out for it. But then God leads you step by step, and there's certain desires that he'll give you. Would you like to teach children? Well, if you've never done it, how would you know? You have to try different things. And so there's many different kinds of 
gifts that are given. We're going to look at here in just a moment. But what do you enjoy doing? Other, but, but also, what do others say about you? Like, I didn't really know that I was called to preach for a long time after I was in Bible college. But it seemed like when I would... Um, uh, when I'd preach, and you know, young preachers when they start out, they really don't know what they are themselves, so they copy other preachers. So I would preach like other preachers. I would preach like my pastor, right? <laughs> and I was very good at it, but it really wasn't me. And it was several years into the ministry. My mother came to me when I was iron. My mother was a member of our church, and she came to me and she said, you know, Thomas, that's what she calls me. She calls me Thomas. She says, Thomas, you know, you're not really a preacher. She says, you're really more of a teacher. And it kind of dawned on me, like I'd never even thought about that before. I thought, you know, I, that's, that, that is a ring of truth to it. I think you're probably right. Because I've, I've preached before, and I can't preach, you know, if, if, if God puts it into me. Um, but really my natural ability, uh, not natural, but the, the gift of God has given to me is I like to explain things. I like to understand things. I like to be things to be interested. I hate boring preaching. I hate boring preaching. I sat too, through too much of it. And if I'm bored with it, then you're going to be bored with it. So I want it to be interesting. I want to leave church learning something. I never, I never heard that before. I, I, I never thought about it. I, I didn't join those dots before. That's an amazing. Bible's amazing. It's a wonderful thing. That's what I love to do. Um, but that, see, that was a progression. But other people said to me when I would uh, preach or teach, and they would say, you know, God bless me with that. Other people would say to me, you know, it seems like you really care about the people you're, you're talking to. And I hope that's true. Um... So other people had um, an influence on the, the direction because, now if I was doing something that said, you're terrible at that, that was a disaster. That was, you know, and there's lots of things that I'm disasters at. Okay, take a hint at that. If you're not good at it, then you might not have a gift for that. If you're teaching a class and everybody's bored to tears and they, and they come away saying, what was that all about? There's something wrong with that. Now, hopefully you're not going to say that about my sermon today. <laughs> but there's something wrong with that. If nobody got anything out of it. Because your gift, when it's operating, is going to profit the body. It's going to have an effect, and it's going to be something that is good. Okay, well, what other kind of gifts other than teaching and preaching? Well, in First uh, Peter chapter 4, look at verse number 10 and 11. And again, you have to take these four passages of scriptures. We don't have time to do this this morning. Put it together, and you'll have a comprehensive list. In the verse 10, he says, As every man hath received the gift. Now, there it is again. You say, well, that doesn't include me. Well, if you're saved, it does include you. Because it says, every man, as every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. What's, it, what's your gift for? It's not for you. It's for other people. Okay? Uh, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In other words, grace is gift. God has given us gifts. And he says, minister, that means to serve one another um, as good stewards. The word steward means it's a responsibility. It also means that one day we have to give an account. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if God gave you a spiritual gift and you took that gift, and the Bible talks about this, I think it's Luke chapter 19, he takes a napkin, he puts the gift in the napkin, and he wraps it up and he hides it. And then one day the master comes and he says, uh, what did you do with the gift? And he pulls the hanky out and he says, well, here it is. Good as new. Just the way you give it to me. He says, well, I didn't give it to you to, 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 to save it or to keep it. I, I gave it to you to use. And wouldn't it be sad that if you, had a, that you have a spiritual gift, maybe you never really used it. Maybe you don't even know that you have it. And one day when you stand before the Lord, the Lord says, you know, I gave you a gift. What did you do with it? And you lived on earth for 50 years. And what did you do with it? Were you, were you a blessing to the, my body? Did you use the gift in the way that I designed for it? And you say, well, no. It's kind of a waste, isn't it? Luke 19, the Lord's not very happy with that man. He didn't invest. That's what it means. Occupy until I come. Do business. Take what I've given to you, where it's one talent, two talents, ten talents, and use it to make a difference with your life while you're here. So he talks about stewards of the manifold grace of God. Verse 11, he says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now the word oracles is speaking about authority. Oracles is the word of God. So when I stand up here, I'm not the mealy mouth of the room. Well, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about I stand up here on my two hind legs and say, Thus saith the Lord, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible teaches. This is what you need to be doing. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister... Let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, 
that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, he doesn't put all the gifts in, in just one particular passage. They're spread all through all four of those. But there are, there are serving gifts. There's the gift of helps. You may say, well, I could never teach a, a, a Sunday school lesson, but I can swing a hammer, um, or I can wheel a wheelbarrow, or I can just, I can clean, or I can do this, or I can, I can serve, I can help people. And there's the gift of helps, there's the gift of serving, there's the gift of ministry, which is what serving is. And you come along somebody else to, to help, and it may be not even just church work, but maybe um, you have widows in the church or people who are genuinely in need. Um, and that's really what the, what the deacons were designed to do in right in the very beginning, Acts chapter 6. Uh, the widows were neglected in the daily ministration and the deacons were chosen to minister, to, to serve. That's what the word deacon means. It means to serve. It means to minister. It means to help. And uh, you may have a widow and her, her grass is, is, is waist deep and her house has fallen down and she's not able and there's men in the church with the ability to, to go help. Help that old woman. Cut her grass for her. Amen. I mean, that's, that's not rocket sense, but it's, it's serving. And it may be a, a gift that you have to be able to do that. So there's ministry gifts. There's serving gifts, helps gifts. Then there's speaking gifts. There is the gift of teaching and preaching. And I think evangelism is also a speaking gift. Now, some of these gifts are responsibility. You can't say, well, I, I, don't, I don't evangelize because I don't have the gift of evangel evangelization. Well, there's the gift of giving. Does that mean you don't give? There's the gift of faith. Does that mean you don't have to believe? No. Um, certain, certain people have, they excel in these areas. And they can help other people and bring them with, with you. But even, you know, you might have the gift of evangelism, but you're still supposed to witness so there's the gift, the speaking gifts, teaching, preaching, evangelism. There's encouragement gifts. It's the gift of exhortation. You know, Barnabas, when he got saved, he got the gift of, of encouragement. His name, his actual name is Joe's. His nickname was Barnabas. And Brother Jeremy's speaking about him on Wednesday night, even though I've got Silas in and I should change the day, but I forgot about it. Paul and Barnabas. Bar means son of. Like Simon bar Jonah, Simon son of Jonah. Um, Nabus is consolation. So bar Nabus is son of consolation. The word consolation, Nabus means encouragement. So bar Nabus or son of encouragement, this is his nickname. Here comes the son of encouragement because every time he comes around, he's encouraging somebody. He meets, he meets old Saul who just got saved and the church, like he talked about on Wednesday night, church didn't want to know him. Uh, you're just trying to get in here and persecute us. And old Barnabas says, come on, Saul, and put his arm around Saul. Come on, I'll bring you in. And old Barnabas, the son of consolation, the son of encouragement brought, he had the gift of exhortation. It's encouragement. It's like, um, you know, the, the boxer's in training, and he's running along the road, and the, the trainer is coming alongside on his bicycle, you know, and he's encouraging them, keep on going, keep on. That's, that's exhortation. That's a, one, the, the actual word is one who's called alongside to speak, to encourage. They're called alongside to encourage the person who's with you. Oh, the church needs that. There's people come in here and they won't tell you. But you know what? Somebody who has the gift of encouragement or discerning of spirits may be able to sense that. First of all, I think all women have this. There's an intuition of women have that men just don't have. But sometimes Christians have this, this sixth sense about them that somebody can come in, they'll be all smiles, and they know there's something not right with that person. And somebody has the gift of encouragement or exhortation, and they sense that. And somehow they come into that relationship, they come alongside, they come near, they come alongside, and they bring words of wisdom or encouragement or hope or faith. And that person leaves being lifted and saying, oh my goodness, that person did so much. They did, I, and maybe it's just sitting down and listening to somebody. But when that person leaves, they're uplifted, they're encouraged because of the gift that you've exercised in their life, the gift of exhortation. You may have that. You may not even know it. By the way, if you're not in church, you can't meet those situations. You can't help the person in the church because you're not here. And so it has to be a community thing. And so there's the gift of exhortation, encouragement, mercy. The gift of, there's a gift of mercy. Now, there's also the gift of the prophet. That's the guy that stands up and says, Thus saith the Lord, this is the way it's supposed to be. That's right, this is wrong. 
And you have to have that too, you know. You have to have that. But on the other, spe- the other side of the spectrum, you have the person who is merciful. And yes, you have done wrong. And yes, you have sinned. And yes, you have messed everything up. But, you know, let me hug you anyway. <laughs> and the person comes with mercy. Sometimes we just need mercy. And there's differences. You see, there's diversities of gifts, but there's one body. And God can use all of those things. There's people who know how to... There's the gift of administration, the gift of organization, the gift of ruling and leadership. There's people that know how to organize. They come into a church and boom, 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 boom. Everything's organized. That's not me. I don't have that gift. But you know what? Even though I don't have that gift, there's other people in the church that do have that gift to help me with the organization of the church. And if it wasn't for them, I don't know what we would do. There's all kinds of different gifts. There's the gift of giving. And that's not just giving monetary. By the way, not just in the church, but they just have that spiritual ability. They see a person with a need. A person, maybe they need something for the children or something for the house. And you have it and you're moved to to give and and you just have that ability to do that. Some people have the gift of faith. No matter what happens, no matter how dark the situation, God God will come through for us. I think Joe Gammon has that gift. He has the gift of giving. He has the gift of faith. And he's always positive. And the Lord's going to be, the Lord's going to do it. The Lord's going to help us. And I'd be thinking, oh, I don't know how this is going to get done. He says, the Lord's going to do it. You know, he's got the gift of faith. And that, what does that do for me? It encourages my faith. And faith begets faith. And, and it encourages one another. And all of us together, exercising all your unique abilities to gather in the body. Wonderful, wonderful things happen. So, you should know what that gift is. You should understand what the Bible says about the gifts. You can discover that. What do you enjoy doing? What does the desire that God has given you? Because God will put the desire, the qualifications, and the abilities in the same package. And God, if there's something wrong if you have a desire to be a preacher, but you can't preach a lick. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with your desire because if God gives you the desire for it, he's going to give you the ability to do it. He's also going to qualify you to do it. All three of those things have to op- operate together. Okay. So let's go to this last thing before I run out of time. And that is the spiritual gifts test. So this is on, what is it, page 13 or something? I can't remember. All right, I'm just going to show you how this works and then we're going to close. Now, you don't have to do it. Probably not a good thing to do it right now unless you've already done it. So here's a list of questions. And what you're to do is to circle one to five how this statement Um, would be true in your life. Now, it's not that you would want it to be true, but it is true. This is how, this is an accurate description of you. I I am always looking for practical ways to help. I'm a helper. I love to help people. I look for ways to help. Is that true of you? If it's really, really true, circle of five. If you're you're not a helper, you run from (laughs) those kinds of things, put a one, okay? Try to stay away from the middle, because the further... Either side, the better it will show up on your, on your evaluation. Then, um, I enjoy, um, let's see, I enjoy public speaking and teaching. Now, for me, that would be five. But for you, it might be a one. You have to drag you in front of a Sunday school class. You have to drag you in front of church. You don't want to do it. All right, so maybe it's a one or a two. Okay. So that's how you go through. I find it easy to motivate people to do the right thing. That might be the gift of exhortation or encouragement. And so you basically go through this and you just you circle those numbers, okay? That's how you do it. I'm trying to be as, as, and it's hard to get it completely right. You know, it's like, it's like everything else. But you do the best you can with it. And then, um, okay, so this is then, when you come to the, the end of the test, this is how you tabulate it. Now, you notice that it goes one to, one to eight. In other words, the, the numbers go this way. So you basically just go through the numbers that you have, the number of the questions. So question number one, I put a five, so I put a five there. Question number two, I had a two, so I put a two there. Question number three, didn't fill it in, but that's where that would go all the way down here. Uh, Nine, 10, 11, 12. So that's how you'd fill it in, right? So when you get all those numbers filled in on those squares, then you come back to this, and then you add across the way, okay? So you add five, 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 seven fives is 35. That's top marks for 35. So if you're a helper, and you put a five to all the helper questions, you're going to end up with 35. Probably nobody's going to have perfect scores on any of these, okay? But see, what you're doing is you're comparing things. It doesn't have to, you don't have to have a perfect score. Your, your, your high score might be three on something, between one and three. But what's going to happen is you're going to find, some of the, some of the, you'll have some of the, the scores be the same. 
but there's going to be one or two or maybe three that will pop up higher than everything else. Okay, so in this example, uh, 35 for that would be for helps and serving. And so, so whatever those numbers are, you pick the, the highest number and you would come across if you're like an evangelist, like Billy's probably an evangelist. Right? He's probably got the gift of evangelist. Billy, he never stops talking about it. witnessing everybody, tracks in his pockets, shirts no good unless he's got a pocket and put a track in it. He's definitely evangelism is high on his, right? So his high, high one's probably going to be here, like 32. And so he puts one by evangelism. Um, um, and, and so maybe, and so whatever. So you put the, the, the scores here and then you correlate. What's the, what's the high score? Number one. Uh, what's the next high score? Number two. What's the next high score? Number three. And so on. Okay. So what that helps you to do is. Helps you in, a, in some sense to see what would be more likely to be your gift. Than, is it foolproof? No. But it gives you an idea of where your gift might be. Where it might lie. Okay. And then there's something else that we have for you. What you then do is take that gift. What is, what is your... And so what we do here is you, on this, this page. Where do I fit? And so you have the dominant gift. What's the high score? Okay. 35. Got to be helps. For somebody okay so then the second score uh a my example is teaching so the, the three has gifts okay you could just circle those three has gifts then you come to this sheet and here's uh one two three here's helps here's teaching here's encourage and exhortation and here's how those gifts might be used in a particular local church setting in other words the minister of the church may have different things uh that the church does um, some of these things our church may, be, may not even do yet. Um, and by the way, if we don't do it and you have a gift for that particular area, you could come to the pastor and say, Pastor, could we do this? And I'd say, hey, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, you do it. <laughs> because if you have a desire for it, maybe you have the ability, maybe you have the gifting for it. Maybe you're the one that starts it. You know, don't come to the church and say, well, that church is no good. They don't do this and they don't do that. Well, maybe the Lord's use, going to use you to, to start doing something with that particular ministry. Maybe the Lord's going to use you to start that ministry because nobody else is there to do it. Nobody else has thought about it, but God has moved on your heart to do it and given you the ability. And guess what? New ministry is born. And the church has benefited because of your involvement. So, um, so anyway, so these are, so if this is your highest gift, then you can look down this and look at those different areas to see how that can um, actually work in a particular local church and i think the last sheet is is to do with our realm and we'll have to talk about i don't have time right now but we'll have to talk about realm is our church database and when you become a member um i think even non-members are on it but um basically if you're coming to the church regularly and you desire our church to have the information so we put your birthdays in the bullet and that type of thing um we basically give you a password and you get into the realm. And if you don't want anybody but leadership to see it, then you can tick that box and that's all will happen. If you don't want to be on it at all, that's fine too. Uh, but in realm, there's areas of ministry that you can volunteer. You can click different boxes and say, yeah, I would like to help with childcare. I'd like to help in the nursery. I'd like to teach a Sunday school class. And you tick that box and then the leadership come back, come into the computer and he can say, I can say, okay, give me all the people who are interested in teaching Sunday school class, and it'll bring all the names up who kind of would be interested in that. And then I know where to go. Because, you know, if you're not interested in teaching Sunday school, there's no sense in me coming to you and say, would you teach Sunday school class? If you're not interested or you don't have a desire, you don't have the ability to do that. So that's, so we're taking spiritual gifts evaluation, looking at the different areas that that might apply to, and then on realm, you can actually volunteer or sign up as a possibility for those particular ministries. So we're trying to get some, some, some from theory to doing something practical in the church. But it's up to you how you, how you use that. All I'm saying to us today as we finish this discipleship lessons is that the Lord Jesus has called us to follow him. Come after me and I will make you to become fishers of men. And the Holy Spirit has given to you at least one spiritual gift to be used in the body to help the rest of us. And when you're doing that one thing, 
the church is blessed and encouraged and built up and edified and wonderful thing. The Lord is able to use you in a wonderful thing in other people's lives. But I tell you what, the byproduct, it's not for you, but the byproduct is, oh, it's wonderful. You will be blessed by that. When you know that God has given you the ability to do something and you use it to help somebody else and that person is helped, you come away feeling fantastic. And it's not just a natural ability. It's not just something you're good at. It's something that God has given you to do and God mission accomplished. And there's, there's a place where you just kind of, you just fall into this little niche. It's the groove where you just know you're doing what God has made you to do. And all of us have that potential. God has called all of us to that. And by the way, all of us are precious, not just in what you can bring to the table, not just in the ability, but you yourself, you are a gift to the church. Not just what you do, but who you are in the body is a gift to the church. It really is. And one of the hardest things, uh, I hate to be negative about this, but one of the hardest things for a church and for a pastor is when, is when your arm gets cut off. It's when people who are precious to the body where God has used you in the church and for some reason something happens and some people have to move and so on and that's, we understand that. But if they just leave and they're not in another church or they're, you know. Do you understand that when you become part of a local assembly and you just leave that you leave, you take something with you when you go, and it's not your, just your ability. But there's some, the church loses something that's precious. It's the relationship, the bond that we have formed with you, the, the love that we have for you, and it's just gone. I just wanted to say that to you because that happens all the time, and it rips the heart out of me as the shepherd, but it rips the heart out of the church. And I want you to know that, that you are precious, you're needed, you're loved, and we want you to stay, we want you to... If there's something wrong, fix it. And that the church would grow and the body would grow and would be happy to gather on our way to heaven. That's what God wants for us.